back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku and Science Fantastic. Today, we're going to leap into outer space. Our special guest today is Christian Davenport. He's a staff writer with the Washington Post and author of an exciting new book just hitting the stands right now called The Space Barons, Elon Musk. Jeff Bezos, and the quest to colonize the cosmos. So, Christian, glad you could be on Science Fantastic. Oh, it's so great to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, first of all, when you were a child, what steered you in the direction of journalism, and why did you write this book, The Space Barons? Well, I was actually sort of uh, dragged into journalism by a friend from my neighborhood in Brooklyn, and we were both in college in Maine, and me, he made me uh, write for him on the college paper, and I got uh, a, a job answering the phones in the sports department of the Washington Post when I was 20 years old. Um, but, you know, it's funny. I grew up – I was born in 1973, so didn't have any, you know, memories of the Apollo program. In fact, my first memory of space and what got me into it was uh, actually the Challenger uh, disaster in 1986. That was my first memory of it. And, uh, you know, the shuttle program for me just wasn't a big thing. I, I think for a lot of people who grew up around my era, the, our, our memories of space, the way it resonated with us was space's history, you know, the old – old grainy black and white uh, videos of uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walking on the moon. But, uh, you know, many, many years later, here I was a reporter at the Washington Post, and I was assigned to a press conference uh, in uh, 2014 with some guy named Elon Musk, who was holding a press conference. And the point of the press conference was to announce he was suing uh, the government and the Air Force, and he was suing them because he wanted them to become uh, a, a – because he wanted to be a customer uh, for for them or have them be a customer for, for SpaceX, rather. And I just thought it was intriguing. And here was this dynamic figure, you know, figure this billionaire entrepreneur talking about space and taking on the establishment. So that was, uh, I realized then, you know, this guy is really up to something. And the more I, you know, spent researching SpaceX and getting to, you know, get a sense of what was going on there, I thought, you know, boy, this really transcends the daily journalism. I do think that this is, you know, it merits a full-length book, you know, because I think this is a time we're going to look back on in 30 and 40 years, and I wanted to document that for people. Okay, well, some people think of NASA as the agency to nowhere. It doesn't really go anywhere anymore. It simply spins wheels around the planet Earth. And when we see science fiction movies like Armageddon, we realize that a space shuttle can't even go into deep space. There's no way that the space shuttle could have carried uh, our astronauts to, uh, to blast this comet with a hydrogen bomb because the space shuttle couldn't even reach deep space. So now we're talking about, quote, the space barons who are changing the entire landscape. Landscape. So what are your thoughts now about private enterprise really stirring the pot so that Washington bureaucrats now have to realize, uh-oh, we have new ideas, new energy, and new leadership in the space program? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we went to the, the moon in uh, 1969, which is, you know, 250,000 miles away. Uh, now, you know, we just go to the International Space Station, which is only about 250 miles up. Uh, and, you know, uh, people forget that the United States government and NASA does not have the ability to fly humans from U.S. soil. In fact, we pay the Russians to do that. So I think these billionaires were looking at, you know, the, the state of the space program and, and wondering why we hadn't pushed for Further, why after Apollo and the, you know the sort of coming of age and the space age in the 50s and the 60s and the early 70s, we didn't push farther and um, really wanted to. I mean that these these. You know, billionaires who grew up at a time where they've disrupted other industries, uh, they use technology and innovation and, uh, and in some ways are just very impatient and move fast to go further faster and wondered why the government and NASA haven't been able to do that and thought that this was an area ripe for a uh, new kind of leadership to come in and uh, to try to go out and go further. Now, let's not forget, though, that particularly, you know, when it comes to SpaceX, I mean, they've had, you know, real partnerships with NASA and you know, Elon Musk and SpaceX get a lot of attention, but the fact of the matter is that SpaceX would not exist but for NASA's help and the contract that's won from NASA and now from the Air Force and, and the Pentagon. Um, so they're doing it, uh, doing it in some partnership, but you're seeing, I think, these companies not just push each other to try to make each other better, but also pushing NASA. 
Okay, let's talk about Elon Musk as a child now, inspired by things like science fiction. I understand that he read Asimov's Foundation series and books like that that talked about a galactic civilization, a civilization where humanity has spread throughout outer space, and it changed his point of view. So tell us a little bit about his early years and how he got a new vision for the space program, not yeah. just beating the Russians. Right, right. No, I think you're absolutely right. that and Elon and all of these guys grew up reading science fiction and wanting wanting to sort of make that a uh, reality. And as you know from your wonderful book, you know, that was something that Elon was focused on very early. So then when he was at a, a moment in his life as a young man and had uh, sold uh, PayPal to eBay and now had this uh, fortune, he could, you know, turn his attention to some of these pursuits, and namely space, and, and was in a conversation, you know, about why hadn't where was NASA's plan to go to Mars? Because that seemed to him to be the next step. You know, we had been to the moon. So where are we on the path to Mars? And he logs on to NASA's website and does an Internet search one evening and, and can't find what the Mars plan was. This is in the early 2000s. And th is thinking to himself, you know, my gosh, this is, you know, the early 2000s, decades after the moon. We should be pushing to Mars right now. Why haven't we? And sort of decided that if NASA wasn't going to do that to sort of fulfill the dreams of his child, than he would and had this early idea, which, you know, is almost right out of a science fiction novel, to send a greenhouse to the surface of Mars. And the idea is that it would be the first living thing, a plant, to be on the surface of Mars. And, you know, this was designed to sort of generate more interest in space, not just to do it, but to get people excited about space, which I think is very important, right, because I mentioned in my childhood it wasn't something that was terribly exciting, and I think a whole generation of people have grown up and have grown, you know, so a little bit tired of, of space, and that, you know, it became routine and maybe even, you know, dare we say, a little bit boring, but, and, you know, but Elon wants to change all of that, and one of his first missions, if you can think about the image of a, of a green leafy subject on the orange surface of Mars, that would be really something. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. In this hour, we're talking about outer space, the exploration of the universe. Well, in the last segment, we talked about billionaire Elon Musk, who pioneered the reusable rocket. And, of course, he has his fleet of rocket ships, the Falcon. Now we'll talk about another billionaire, and that is Jeff Bezos of Amazon.com, the richest man in the world, and apparently the owner of the Washington Post and therefore your boss. So the question is, was Jeff Bezos also inspired by science fiction to create his spaceport in Texas? He was, absolutely. He used to spend every summer on his grandfather's ranch in South Texas and uh, would went through the entire collection of the local library there, which actually was a very extensive uh, connection of science fiction books that had been donated to the library. And also, I think, you know, his grandfather was a great influence on him. He uh, was one of the first employees at ARPA before it was, was DARPA. And um, so Jeff, you know, really grew up as a, as a real space fan. He grew up watching um, Star Trek. His uh, his dog was named after a Star Trek character, and even uh, to this day, one of his uh, companies is named after a Star Trek character. So that was, uh, you know, these are childhood dreams. And he says he talks about how he, when he was five years old, he remembers watching uh, the first Apollo 11 or the Apollo 11 uh, lunar landing, and and that really left an imprint on him. So yeah, he was. This is a childhood dream for him. Now, also, I understand that he has a vision. Uh, Elon Musk had a vision of creating a multi-planet species because perhaps it's too dangerous to put life on just the Earth. But Jeff Bezos, he has a vision as well. So what is his vision? His idea is ultimately not just to go to colonize a single planet like Mars, but to go to space and just spread out in space. You know, he likes to say he's working toward the day where millions of people are living and working in space. And the idea is to use space to actually protect the Earth. That with the population growth that we have here on Earth, that the demand on energy and resources uh, were at, at some point in the future just going to outgrow the Earth, where there's just not going to be enough resources to sustain the population. Um, so what he wants to do is to help build the infrastructure to go out into the stars and um, lift heavy manufacturing off the surface of the Earth and do that in space where you can mine asteroids for precious metals. You can have, you know, 
full 24 hour uh, uh, sunlight and solar energy. And the idea is that if you stop manufacturing on Earth where the resources are limited and put the, do that in space and then bring those resources back down to Earth, then you help preserve the Earth. When he's been thinking and talking about this for a long, long time, he gave a speech when he was in high school and uh, when he was a valedictorian of his class and he said that Earth should be preserved as a national park. Now when he gives the same speech or a different version of it, he changes it slightly and he says that Earth should be zoned, you know, residential and light industrial, but all the heavy industry would be up in space off the surface of the Earth. And what he wants to do now is help build that infrastructure to get up there. Right. And he's just not talking hot air. He has his own spaceport in Texas and his own fleet of rockets. So tell us a little bit about his spaceport and the new Shepard and the new Armstrong rocket. That's right. He's got a, a lot of land that he owns in, in West Texas, and he's built his first rocket, the New Shepard, as you mentioned, which is named for uh, Alan Shepard, the first American in space. It's a suborbital vehicle. It, that means it would go straight up and come straight down. Uh, and the idea, they've flown it many, many times, and not only it's reusable, so it flies straight up and then comes back and lands. It's done this successfully a number of times now. And what they want to do, and it, this could come as soon as this year, put human beings on board and have uh, space tourists who would go up, launch in the rocket, they'd be in a capsule, they'd fly, uh, you know, get to just past the, the edge of space, about 100 kilometers or so, you'd be able to unbuckle uh, your seatbelt and float around the cabin for four or five minutes and then sit back down and uh, and come back down and, and land in, in West Texas. Uh, they're also building at the same time a new rocket that would be capable of getting to orbit named uh, New Glenn, after John Glenn, the first American who made it to orbit. Uh, and that it would be a really significant feat for them. That really puts them in the space game in terms of being able to compete for NASA contracts and Pentagon contracts and going up against big players like the United Launch Alliance, uh, the conglomerate of U um, Lockheed Martin and Boeing, and of course, even SpaceX. So he's, uh, you know, taking his time. They move a little bit slower, a little bit more deliberately, but you really can't count them out. Now, some people have said that maybe we're going to have a traffic jam on the moon because on one hand, NASA has its SLS booster rocket, as you pointed out, and Elon Musk has his Falcon and the Falcon Heavy. And now we have Jeff Bezos with perhaps the, the new Armstrong rocket, three moon rockets, two of which are funded by private enterprise, three moon rockets capable of going to the moon. So what's going to happen? I mean, what are your thoughts if you could project a few years into the future? Well, it's really interesting, you know, and you wonder, you know, as a, as a journalist and an author covering this, you know, is there going to be a market that's going to sustain all of this growth? There are all of these rockets in development right now, and the United Launch Alliance is also building a Vulcan rocket, uh, and there are a lot of other small launch vehicles under development now, and you just sort of wonder, is this going to be uh, sustainable? Um, you know, and we had uh, Elon launch the, the Falcon Heavy, but it doesn't right now have a big uh, manifest the way its workhorse rocket, the Falcon 9, does. So you, you wonder, is the market going to be sustainable um, to pull all of those up there, and are we going to have a place to go? I mean, it's, you talk about going to the moon and having a traffic jam there, um, but are we going to have places in low Earth orbit to go as well? Um, you know, there's talk of commercializing the International Space Station and other companies, um, you know, such as uh, Bigelow aerospace building habitats that can go into space. And I think that, you know, if you have the low Earth orbit as a stepping stone to the moon and you have other destinations, then it can be sustained. And if you have enough satellites that need to go up uh, to sustain those launches, you know, but let's not forget, I mean, the rockets, that's just really the transportation. I, you know, in some ways, it's the destination that really matters. Okay, well, some people point to the reusable rocket that you mentioned um, in the same way that the used car market after World War II really opened up uh, the car as part of American culture because today more used cars are sold than new cars. And so with reusable rockets, do you think there could be a new renaissance? Prices could be dropping by trem tremendous uh, leaps and bounds, opening up outer space to, to tourism and for all sorts of other activities. What are your thoughts? I will, and yes, and in some ways that's already happening. I mean, we've seen that with SpaceX. They go in and offer a price that was far below, you know, what companies had traditionally been uh, charging for these launches. And now that they're flying, you know, they're reusing their rockets, 
and reflying them and, you know, reflying their spacecraft, that has the potential to dramatically lower the cost. And that's sort of the goal from the beginning, to, to lower the cost dramatically, make space just much more affordable, much more accessible, and that you launch then at a much higher cadence, then you're much more efficient and reliable. And, you know, the ultimate goal is to make it more like a commercial airline operation. That's what SpaceX wants to do. That's what uh, Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin want to do. And that's what I think all these companies want to do to make it, you know, more routine. Now space is hard. It's risky. It's expensive. It's dangerous. And if you can, you know, make it much more efficient you know, by an order of magnitude, then um, that really could open up space. And then you see some of the uh, perhaps economic drivers that, you know, there's an economic model that justifies that high cadence all coming together. I think all of those are bound together. And uh, speaking about Mars, you mentioned earlier, um, Elon Musk has his own Mars rocket, the BFR, B for big, R for rocket, and F for you know what. <laughs> and uh, is it real? I mean, is the BFR really a rocket that's going to get off the ground and take us to Mars? Because, of course, NASA has an alternative design to go to Mars. Uh, what are your thoughts about going to Mars? Well, the BFR, I mean, well, it's hard to go to Mars, and, uh, you know, the BFR is, you know, it's still in development. Uh, Elon has said it might take short hops next year, but, you know, let's not forget NASA's rocket, the SLS, is also okay, in Christian, development. Okay, Christian, we're going to have to we'll take see. a short commercial break, but after the break, let's talk about Mars and then also space tourism uh, with yet another billionaire. <laughs> Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. With us today is Christian Davenport, staff writer with the Washington Post, author of an exciting new book, Just Hitting the Stands, The Space Barons, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and the Quest to Colonize the Cosmos. Well, Christian, when we last left off, we were talking about Mars. Mars is really far away, not just three days uh, by a rocket, but maybe two years for a round-trip mission. Uh, how serious are the two proposals, one by NASA and one by Elon Musk, two different proposals to go to Mars? What are your thoughts? Well, and now that I think they're changing a little bit, too, particularly with the Trump administration coming into the White House. Um, under President Obama, he had said, you know, we had been there, we had been to the moon, and now they were going to shoot to Mars and had a campaign <coughs> to orbit Mars in the early uh, 2030s. Now they're talking about a return to the moon and using the moon as a stepping stone to get to Mars, to build the technology and to study, you know, how humans would, would interact in deep space before they go on that long journey to Mars. Now, for SpaceX, Mars has been the goal from the very beginning. That's Elon's goal. I mean, everywhere you go in, in SpaceX's headquarters, you see pictures of Mars. You see pictures of Mars being terraformed. Uh, you know, when I go visit their offices here in Washington, D.C., there's a, um, a, a foot map at the door with the footprints, you know, in the red clay of Mars. And so that's, you know, really uh, their goal. But I think now they realize that they're going to need to be able to do that in partnership with NASA and create a, a program. Now they have a partnership for low Earth orbit to deliver cargo and then uh, also fly crews to the International Space Station in low Earth orbit. Now you hear NASA and SpaceX talking about public-private partnerships to work together to get to the moon and then eventually on to Mars. So I think any program like that it's going to involve maybe even not just NASA but international partners, the way we, we uh, all band together on the International Space Station with the European Space Agency, the Japanese uh, and the Canadians and the Russians coming together and then also leveraging, you know, industry as a whole. At least that's the, the goal of the current White House. You know, that uh, these companies like Blue Origin can land, uh, bring a suborbital rocket and land it precisely on Earth. They could use that technology to build a lunar lander or even one for Mars as well. So I think they're looking at it and being a concerted effort together. And speaking about the moon, uh, NASA laid out a potential moon rocket whereby we have an orbiter. Just like we have uh, the space station around the Earth, we have a mini space station around the moon. And from that, we can launch a space probe to Mars. So what are your thoughts? We have essentially two uh, ideas. One is to jump to Mars directly with the BFR. The other is to create a lunar orbiter 
just like the orbiting space station, and perhaps use that as a stepping stone. So what are your thoughts about whether or not any of these will come to be? Well, and, and you know, from NASA's standpoint on that, the, uh, the the orbiter, the gateway, as they call it, you know, that's the plan now. But you always wonder that if another administration comes in and would they change the plan and say, no, no, we want to go directly back to Mars, and it shifts the wind. And that's why there's a lot of concern. But I think as of now, they want to build that, uh, you know, that orbiting platform in the vicinity of the moon, around the moon, that could be, you know, there it could be uh, have humans living on there. You could use it to send cargo and supplies back and forth, and then ultimately, you know, go to the poles where there's water ice and use that as rocket fuel, uh, you know, the, the hydrogen and the, and the oxygen to go, you know, further deeper into space. But Elon's got his BFR, as you mentioned. Okay, well, let's take another short commercial break, and afterwards we'll talk about space tourism. What about you? If you have two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars $250,000, would you go into outer space as a tourist? Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. With us today is Christian Davenport, staff writer with the Washington Post and author of a new book, The Space Barons, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and the Quest to Colonize the Cosmos. Well, Christian, where we last left off, we were talking about, well, all these billionaires that are funding a new era in space exploration, not waiting for the Washington bureaucrats to catch up. But we also have space tourism on the rise. Richard Branson of Virgin Atlantic has his own company and his own rocket. And, of course, we have uh, Jeff Bezos with his rocket, also capable of putting tourists to the very edge of space. So what do you think is going to happen to space tourism with not one but two different approaches? Yeah, we might get a little competition here. Uh, Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic already has more than 700 people, it says, signed up to fly. They charge $250,000 uh, a ticket. Now, they, the program has been in the works for, uh, you know, since really since 2004, 2005, so it's been a little slow going. And, of course, they had a uh, fatal accident in 2014 during a test flight and actually killed uh, the, the co-pilot. Uh, but they've been back and flying since then and, and and recently on their new vehicle, Spaceship Two, have flown supersonic uh, now twice in a row and uh, could, you know, put human beings uh, into uh, space uh, by this year. Um, Jeff Bezos and Blue Origin are, are, are also uh, – have been flying their rocket, the New Shepard, wanting to get people, you know, everyday people into space. They haven't yet announced uh, what their tickets would cost, but I know they have a lot of interest. You know, one thing that's interesting is that with Blue Origin, they've got a more traditional rocket with a capsule on top that would just blast off and go into space, and the capsule would separate. Uh, Virgin Galactic Spaceship Two is more like a space plane, if you will. It's tethered to the belly of a of a mothership, and the mothership goes up to 40,000 feet or so, the space plane drops, fires its engines, and then shoots up into space. So I know uh, uh, Richard Branson has told me that he thought he might have a little bit of an edge where, you know, you get a nice soft landing on a, on a runway as opposed to being in a capsule and coming down. But I think there'll be people who would be interested in going up in both, and it's possible we have first flights as soon as this year. Now, let me ask you a very practical question, and that is the cost. Uh, numbers have been floated around saying that uh, space tourism could cost maybe $200,000, $250,000 a pop to go up to the edge of space, and then to go to the space station, $20 million and higher to go orbiting completely around the Earth on the International Space Station, which some tourists have already done. In fact, we had one of them uh, on the radio. So what are your thoughts about the economics of space? Space tourism. I think the goal uh, is to bring down the cost. I mean, as you mentioned, Virgin Galactic now charges $250,000 a ticket. It's very expensive. There are not too many people who are going to be able to afford that, so you limit your market size. But, and this is their goal, if they're able to fly reliably and safely and efficiently and to do it repeatedly over time, I mean, on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis, uh, have multiple flights a month, then their goal is to actually dramatically lower the cost uh, of doing that. Uh, and then also, the same with going to orbit. I mean, Blue 
George and Jeff Bezos have talked about flying uh, tourists into orbit, and um, SpaceX has also talked about flying tourists uh, on a trip uh, around the moon. Uh, but in order for that to become accessible, you know, for the average person, the price is going to have to come down and come down dramatically. Okay, so you think the market could be rather limited, right? If you um, if you have spare change to the tone of two hundred fifty thousand dollars, then you too can uh, send somebody up into outer space. Um, well, let me ask you a question: Would you do it? Would you go into outer space if your company would foot the bill and have you rocket to the very edge of space? Absolutely. Uh, although, as I always say, not on the first flight. I would like some test pilots to go first and have them work out the kinks. But, yes, and actually when I met with Richard Branson and with Jeff Bezos, I had gone to the uh, the National Ar- Archives at NASA, and they had a journalist in space program during the shuttle, which was actually canceled after the Challenger uh, disaster. But I went back and got the application for the journalist in space program and, and said, you know, frankly, if you want to send – if you want to make space accessible to people, if you want to democratize space, you need to have journalists and independent researchers go up and experience that and write about it. And uh, um, Bob Smith, the CEO of Blue Origin, told me, he said, yeah, that's the whole point of the thing is to open up space to the masses. You know, we want journalists. He said, we want ballet dancers, which I thought was kind of interesting, if you could imagine that, and all sorts of ordinary people. Okay. Well, again, there are people who really want to go to the very edge of space, and they have the money to do it. Welcome back to Science Fantastic with Professor Michio Kaku. The book is called The Space Barons, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and the Quest to Colonize the Cosmos. And also go to my website if you're curious about space travel, mkaku.org, m-k-a-k-u.org is the email uh, website. And uh, I've written my book about space travel called The Future of Humanity, all about terraforming Mars, is interstellar travel in the cars, will we have to modify our bodies and become immortal if we're going to explore outer space? All these topics are in my book, The Future of Humanity. Well, we're talking about a new book, The Space Barons, about Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and the quest to colonize the cosmos. And we have yet another billionaire, Paul Allen of Microsoft. So tell us a little bit about the fourth billionaire that you mentioned in your book. Yeah, so Paul Allen has a long history in space and actually backed, uh, in 2004, the Ansari X Prize, which sent the first, you know, purely commercial vehicle and no government involvement, uh, that went past the edge of space, did it three times in 2004. And actually that, that vehicle, uh, Spaceship One, hangs in the Air and Space Museum, um, next to the Spirit of St. Louis. So, uh, was, you know, made history then. Um, people thought at the time that would really sort of open up commercial space and it took, has taken longer uh, for that to happen. But now uh, Paul Allen has returned, and he's got a company called Strata Launch, and they're building uh, what would be the world's largest airplane. Uh, they're building it in a uh, massive hangar in uh, Mojave, California. And the idea is that this plane is so big that it would be able to carry not one but as many as three rockets you know, on its belly and air launch those into space so that it would you know, reach a cruising altitude and the rockets would – um, fall away and then uh, light their motors and engines and then take off and go to space. Um, he's really interested, Paul Allen is, in uh, the small satellite technology and this idea that, you know, satellites which were, you know, uh, so big and exquisite and expensive, um, you know, that you'd launch one and want it to operate for 25 or 30 years, but now the technology has gotten to the point where, you know, many satellites are much smaller, the size of even a, uh, a shoebox, and instead of putting up one big one that has to last a long time, you could put up constellations of dozens or hundreds or even thousands of them. And that, to Paul Allen, 
Allen is really interesting. Remember, he comes from a tech background, and one of the things the astronaut or these satellites could do is beam the Internet to all corners of the Earth, the 4 billion or so people who don't have access to the Internet. They could also do things like monitor the health of the Earth. Um, so that's what he's really interested in, is launching in these small uh, satellites from its um, massive plane, the Stratolaunch, would actually, when it flies, and it, they say it may fly as soon as uh, this summer, would be the largest airplane ever to fly since Howard Hughes' Spruce Goose. Now it's, it's measured by wingspan. Okay, well, we're talking about billionaires, and yet there is yet another set of billionaires from Google, and these billionaires want to back uh, a project to mine the asteroid belt of very rare, valuable minerals and make it profitable like a gold rush. So what are your thoughts about a new gold rush in outer space to help pay and foot the bill for a lot of these uh, vehicles? Yeah, and that's, you know, there's a company called Planetary Resources that wants um, to do that, and their goal is to go out and mine asteroids and mine space. And I think that, you know, if they're able to go out and do that, and, and they're, you know, talking about prospecting now and identifying which, which asteroids to go after and what the precious metals are there. I think there was one asteroid that a um, uh, Wall Street firm, investment firm, had even valued at a trillion dollars, all of the resources in there, then that really could be a significant significant change and uh, sort of fulfill this vision that you can take, you know, heavy industry off Earth and, and move it up into space. I think this is, you know, sort of a long-term aspirational goal, but you've got, as you mentioned, these billionaires and these entrepreneurs who have, you know, all kinds of success focusing a lot of time and energy and resources into making these uh, dreams come true and that this idea that you mine asteroids is really one of them. It's not just for precious metals, of course, but, you know, if there is water and space in the form of ice, you know, that's hydrogen and oxygen, and that's a rocket fuel, then that helps you, you know, get out even deeper into space. So, you know, a lot of visions, a lot of ideas out there that, you know, are really being pursued actively in a way I think maybe not so many people are aware of, which is why I wanted to write the book. Okay, now there are also pros and cons about private enterprise entering into the mix. The pro, of course, is that private enterprise can move much faster than uh, the lumbering bureaucracy of, of the government, and you can have uh, make breakthroughs very rapidly. That's the plus side, but there's also the negative side, because after all, these people want to profit. Uh, these people have their own hidden agenda, and that is they want to make a buck to pay for the expenses, and what happens if they lose interest? Uh, billionaires can be fickle. So what are your thoughts about overall the pros and cons and what this has done for space exploration? Yeah, that's a really good point. And you think, too, about the regulation of the industry and uh, who's in charge. And some you wonder, too, about is, is the technology moving faster than the pace of regulation? I mean, just take the space tourism, which we were talking about earlier. Um, right now, if you, uh, you know, the FAA says you've got to, you know, ensure the safety of the property, people and property on the ground, but uh, essentially there's an informed consent standard where, uh, Dr. Kaku, if you want to get on the rocket, all you have to do is sign, you know, your name as if you were going to go skydiving or bungee jumping, and uh, and that's it. It's an informed consent standard. But you have to wonder what would happen if on one of these flights the rocket explodes and people lose their lives. Will there be, uh, you know, a bigger effort, you know, to regulate it? What happens with asteroid mining, for example? Who owns those, uh, who owns those resources in space? I mean, do we need to revisit the Outer Space Treaty? How does that all work? I guess we'll find out. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time. 